So uh, I think we can all agree that um, the danger or the threat is kind of real. I think you all heard of the battery producer Vata, who has to slow down the production because of a cyber incident and is now delaying the reports, which also have financial um, consequences. In the US, the healthcare giant United Health is attacked. That leads to a big debate about the uh, security of uh, health data in the United States. And maybe you remember communities being uh, unable to uh, issue formal documents because their IT provider was uh, hacked. So I think we all know the problem. And I think we all can agree that the answer to this can't be local, it can't be national only, and it can't be only regional. I think it has to be a partnership with like-minded countries. And to talk about this between the United States and Germany, I would uh, invite Claudia Plattner on stage. She is the president of the BSE, the German Agency for IT Security. Welcome, and thanks for being here. Okay. He is not here with us, but he's digitally here. And it's Brandon Wales. He's executive director of the Infrastructure and Cybersecurity Agency, CISA, in the United States. Hi, Brandon. Hi, how are you doing? Great. Thanks for making the time. And no um, great to have you here. So maybe start with um, Claudia Platner. You uh, worked in IT for quite a long time with the European Central Bank before starting the, your job at the BSE. Uh, how did the threat landscape and maybe also the way we discuss cybersecurity evolve uh, since then? Well, I have to say that, um, first of all, hello. Hi. Um, good to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I would say it, it has evolved immensely. So, um, first of all, cybersecurity or actually cyber attacks, cyber criminality has become a big business. So that's, that's one of the major shifts we've seen over the course of the last few years. Um, it has become big business, and it's also become a very professional business, and that's really the part that worries us the most. Um, you have very professional attackers on the other side, and um, they partner up, and they have really the, the, sometimes really the perfect workflow that we're all striving for in our businesses on a daily basis, but they have it, and, and that's really worrisome. The other thing is, <coughs> Uh, cyber security, or actually cyber attacks, um, have become part of a, of, a, of a political landscape. They're being used in hybrid scenarios. Um, so we're seeing a whole new world opening up there. Um, and that's the bad news. The good news is uh, cyber security, the defense side, has definitely moved into focus a lot more than it, than it was like 10 years ago. Um, so we, we do see uh, um, our economies, our societies, starting to adjust to this scenario to those scenarios and really getting the measures in um, and I'm I'm an optimist I believe we can handle this but uh, to come back to the question you've just been asked there's still a lot of work to do thank you um, mr. Wells maybe from your point of view you worked in Homeland Security f before you worked with CISA so what is your take on how the threat landscape evolved and maybe also um, how the threat actors evolved since then uh, sure. So I think it's, and I'm going to build up what Claudia said, because I think we have seen uh, what I would probably argue is um, kind of two major trends that have led us to where we are in the kind of current threat environment. One, as Claudia said, um, the kind of cyber criminal elements have gotten far more sophisticated and a lot more specialized uh, to the degree where you have some actors that are focused just on gaining initial access, these data access brokers, you have some actors who are building tools for the less sophisticated cyber criminals that can then leverage, and that is somewhat democratized cyber criminal activity where um, even if a criminal is no longer executing the attacks, they're now just building tools, making them available in the dark web, and um, has allowed kind of less sophisticated and a broad array of cyber criminals to get into the game. And I think we have seen um, the the rise of ransomware kind of run rampant across the entire globe with significant impacts on multiple countries, um, all enabled by this type of acceleration in the cyber criminal elements. The second uh, major trend is the um, uh, growing willingness of nation states to both prepare for and conduct attacks 
Uh, so we have seen most recently in the United States where we have discovered evidence that Chinese uh, state cyber actors have gained initial access uh, to U.S. critical infrastructure with no intelligence value. Um, the only purpose of their um, uh, pre-positioning on this infrastructure is to launch future disruptive or destructive attacks. Um, and, you know, they're not, they're the most recent country for us to discover, but they are certainly not the only one who wants that capability and is seeking that type of leverage. Um, we know other actors like Russia and Iran are doing uh, or, or have similar efforts underway or have attempted to in the past. Um, and I think long term, uh, that poses probably the most significant uh, risk, uh, particularly if they're willing to launch destructive attacks against the uh, infrastructure most essential to our way of life. Thank you, Mr. Wells. But um, Mrs. Plantner, when we look at the evolution of cyber threats, um, Mr. Wells mentioned the state-sponsored actors, which have like uh, immense capability and also resources. Um, we talk a lot about AI getting accessible by every one of us. So do you see that this is also used in the threat landscape, maybe by criminals to, to, uh, to enter an organization? Um, let me start off by saying that the biggest problem we're currently facing in Germany, and I think it's somewhat the same for the US, um, <clears throat> Um, the most urgent problem we're seeing, maybe not the most, the most important, but the most urgent problem we see is ransomware attacks. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one of the, that's the biggest challenge really. Um, so we keep on joking about it, uh, as in there are cities in Germany where you cannot get married anymore because basically all their systems are down. Uh, <laughs> all right, maybe, <laughs> maybe that, but anyway. Um, and uh, we, we do see companies that are, that are really being victims of, of ransomware attacks not being able to continue their business. And um, that is, of course, a huge problem. And um, what happens here is that in this particular th threat type, if you will, um, AI is so far not playing a huge role, mm -hmm. but we do see it increasing. Let me put it this way. Um, so what happens here is that speed is of the essence. Usually vulnerabilities which are there have to be exploited within days, sometimes even hours, and are exploited sometimes even within hours. And um, what uh, Brandon has just pointed out, you know, having all those specialists in line that, that you can just book and use technical APIs to just basically put them into your, your process as an attacker makes it very easy to attack, very, very easy. And here AI is helping. It's helping with uh, things like really putting the process together. It's helping with, well, if you need to, to tell them basically where to, to basically send the ransom, you have to do that sometimes in their own language. And their K uh, AI comes in very handy by just translating what needs to be done. So it really it speeds up the process. But we do not see this as the major tool uh, for, for attacks yet. But we do see an, uh, um, um, an incline there. Um, what worries us there is... With the attackers being very far away, it's very difficult to get at them with law enforcement. Mm -hmm. They are very often state-sponsored, or at least state-approved, <laughs> if you will. Yeah, let's put it that way. So they're very far away, and there's, there's very few possibilities for us to actually get at them. The next thing is we're still a rich country, and that means, of course, it's attractive to, mm -hmm. to uh, attack us. And last but not least, it's way too easy, way too easy. And the last part, as in um, being victims that are easily attacked, becomes easier with new technologies. Mm -hmm. At the same time, that also puts us in a position where we can use exactly the same um, technologies to defend ourselves. And what will be of the essence here is speed. Mm -hmm. We have to, to use and develop those technologies at the same speed at which the attackers are using them to attack us. Mm -hmm. So those would be my views on that question. Thank you. Mr. Wells, would you like to add something? Yeah, no, I, th I think um, Claudia is exactly right. What we, are most, what we are seeing now is the initial stages of experimentation by groups about how to use these AI tools. I think it's, um, uh, we are seeing the same in the defensive world. How do we exploit new AI technology to enable stronger cyber defenses that are better able to predict anomalous activity and detect uh, never seen before uh, malicious malicious code, et cetera. So I think both sides are kind of jockeying for uh, how do we take advantage of this unique moment. Um, we are not yet seeing kind of 
uh, AI being used uh, at scale to be weaponized against us. But, you know, like all new technology, that's probably only a matter of time. Um, I think what we have before us is this uh, unique opportunity to not repeat the mistakes of the internet age where we decided not to focus on security up front and we are now struggling uh, to build in security to systems that um, uh, were never really designed uh, to be secure uh, up front. And I think we should not repeat that same mistake in the AI age. Um, and we need to find and identify ways in which we can build stronger security mechanisms, stronger safeguards into this technology. And I think we are trying to focus increasingly on ways in which um, uh, security is a paramount importance along with uh, features and cost and and speed to market uh, that is that is driving uh, the the technology ecosystem. Mr. Wells, you said um, it's very interesting because you said building secure pro uh, products, and uh, for a long time the idea was the problem is in front of the screen, like the human. And uh, maybe it's a little bit unfair because a password, as some researchers say, is the most inhumane security uh, measure that you can probably think of. Um, and we saw that in the United States cybersecurity strategy that there has been a mindset shift to be more like from the human to the product to the companies that sell these products. We have this in the European Union with the Cyber Resilience Act, for example, security by design. Do you think that there's a, uh, um, as Platner, do you think that there's a mindset shift? Not exactly sure that it's a mindset shift, people's responsibility and, and, and the necessity to make them aware of, of what are the risks um, won't change, I think. But nonetheless, um, we have to look at all sides of, uh, of, of the whole story. I mean, for, for now, there's the, the two biggest attack vectors, the two biggest uh, problems we're facing are, are, first of all, vulnerabilities in systems. So that's that's one of the major issues. Um, you know, some some gaping holes in the systems that can be exploited, and the exploits are out there. And uh, the other one is um, credentials. So that's exactly what you were getting at, as in um, having credentials, um, for example, from someone who's left the company and and the login still exists, or passwords which are just not set properly, or put somewhere in the code so that easy password spraying attacks really get you what you need in order to then enter a system and then find your way and, and uh, enhance your your um, credentials in there. Um, all of it has to be addressed. Mm -hmm. All of it has to be addressed, and the responsibilities lie also. Yes, with the producers of software and systems, so that's why the Cyber Resilience Act will play a major role. Um, and that's the one thing, so producers will be responsible for the cybersecurity of their products throughout the product's life cycle. Mm -hmm. And that in itself makes perfect sense, right? If you buy a car, then you want to make sure that for, I don't know, at least the next 10 years, you're, cap you're able to, uh, you put, you're, it's possible to buy spare parts, right? So that's kind of like the same thing, making sure that there are updates and stuff. And on the other hand, we have another piece of regulation, the so-called NIS uh, 2 directive, um, which basically says the, the users of software, as in the companies, the institutions, they also have to play their part and take proper care. Just because there's an update and a patch for a problem does not mean that automatically the patch and the problem, uh, the, 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 the patch will be applied. The company that uses the software will also have to apply it. So it's really, it's, it's a twofold thing. So both sides have to play their part and passwords and credentials do come in. And of course, we also fa um, advise you all to use two-factor authentication for anything <laughs> that's important. And yes, things will become bet better with pass keys instead of passwords, I hope so. Mr. Wells, thank you. Uh, Mr. Wells, what is the uh, US take on security by design, maybe? Yeah, I mean, I, this is obviously a, a major priority for, uh, for CISA. And I think, as you noted, um, it is something that has been, is part of one of the major policy shifts that has been called for in the, in the new US cyber strategy, um, which basically says that the burden for cybersecurity should be placed on those best able to handle it. And I think, um, it is clear there's always going to be some burden on the end users, whether that's individual users to ensure that their own devices are secure or um, uh, companies and critical infrastructure to uh, put in place reasonable security measures. But I think we have seen for too long that security is an afterthought uh, in critical in, in technology. And 
we have a multi-billion dollar cybersecurity industry because we have a insecure multi-trillion dollar technology industry. And if we are going to attempt to secure um, uh, infrastructure one patch at a time, uh, that is a that is a losing battle when there are 18,000 new vulnerabilities every single year in, in critical technology. Um, and so we have been uh, working uh, you know, both things seen and unseen related to how do we improve the technology ecosystem. Uh, we worked with a number of international partners, including our, our colleagues in, in Germany and in other parts of Europe on a series of products that seem to kind of start to identify what are the kind of key elements of uh, secure by design regime. Uh, we've gathered feedback from industry themselves uh, to help us make sure that when we are making recommendations, uh, uh, we can, um, uh, we you know, we can speak with with one voice and have it resonate in industry. Um, but I, I think, you know, some of this is going to be challenging, um, and but some of it is not. I mean, we have seen major uh, campaigns, uh, major vulnerabilities being exposed, um, being exploited by ransomware operators for simple design flaws that have been fixed for years. So. Um, Large companies around the world were impacted by the uh, vulnerability in MoveIt uh, file transfer software. That was a simple SQL injection vulnerability, um, which, again, a few lines of code that have really been known for more than a decade, and that problem could have been avoided. We have still have large numbers of vulnerabilities in because we continue to use uh, code base relying on non-memory safe coding languages um, when there are memory safe ones available today that are um, uh, can be used. And I think we have seen some companies start to say that they're going to, you know, all of their new code will be in memory safe languages. So we're starting to see that move. Um, but this really needs to be at, at a much more significant scale, given the, just the size and breadth of, of the global technology ecosystem. When we talk about um, this, ways of uh, helping and foster and making societies more resilient. Um, we also talk about cyber norms, for example. Um, Mr. Wells, what is your take on cyber norms? What should they be, especially when we work together as Germany and the United States? I mean, I, I think that um, the US and, and Europe and others have been establishing cyber norms for for more than a decade. Um, there has been work both through through the UN through and through other fora um, that seek to identify kind of what are those basic principles in cyberspace. But I think one of the areas that we need to continue to focus on is ensuring that we are calling out bad behavior. Uh, when when countries, when organizations, when criminals are acting outside of those acceptable norms, because that is the way in which we're going to make and set clear acceptable boundaries uh, for what type of behavior is, is a, you know we are willing to accept um, in cyberspace. I think it is one of the reasons why the United States has been um, so aggressive in calling out and attributing malicious cyber activity. Uh, when and where we see it, both affecting the United States directly, but including uh, attacks that are that are impacted others in Europe. So, for example, the Russian attack against Viasat in the uh, early days of the of the war in Ukraine, uh, the disruptive effect that it had on critical infrastructure in multiple other European countries. Again, those types of attacks we see as um, unacceptable in in um, in in the global cyber ecosystem, and I think we are looking for as many like-minded countries to join us as possible when we do that, because that is the way in which we're ultimately going to ensure that those norms have meaning and have impact. Mm -hmm. um, Ms. Platner, um, when we look at cooperation, cyber norms are one um, one aspect. What other fields of cooperation do you see? Oh, there's plenty of fields. Um, so uh, the things we're working on. Um, one that is very, very technical um, has to do with standards, like just normal technical standards. If you agree on, on, on safe protocols, for example, for communication, for how to build things, 
everything becomes a lot easier. Um, and that's also from an economic point of view makes a lot of sense to just agree on a few things. But this is, this is global, and that means we also have to play our part in those negotiations, because if they are just left to the other side, then of course we end up with standards which are not so much focusing on security. So that's, that's one thing. The next thing is everything around um, um, certifications. So if we define what we consider safe and we agree there's also a big market for making sure that we mutually recognize and harmonize uh, um, between our countries um, and, and, and yeah, like-minded countries where we basically say we can, we can increase the market. Because if we build on, on secure products and we recognize the security mutually, that also means the markets get bigger. And that binds us closer together, so that's another thing. When it comes to cybersecurity itself, uh, one very important step is exchanging information. That's like the most important part, exchanging intelligence, threat intelligence, to make sure that others do not run into the same problems that you've just, um, uh, just realized can be solved in a certain way. You know, saving each other from, from the harm that is, that is going on there. So there's, there's plenty of opportunities uh, to, to, to go about this. We have this huge initiative, counter-ransomware initiative, where we try to work together on these problems. So there's, there's plenty of possibilities, all the way up to law enforcement, really, um, or finding, finding um, the way that finances go through cryptocurrency uh, markets and, and finding what we can do there. So there's, there's plenty of possibilities to tackle this problem together, and I think we have to, because it really it doesn't end at the border. Um, bits and bytes don't really care about borders, not at all. Not one bit. <laughs> Fight. So I have uh, a thousand remaining questions, actually, but um, I got a sign in the front row and it's still only five minutes left, so I would love to open up the discussion for the audience for questions, and I have see one, two, maybe, yeah. There, there. That means short answers, huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, perfect. Yeah, Gunther Tau from the company TBS. Uh, I've been last week with Johannes at Tagesspiegel, True. and we were talking about uh, cybersecurity. And well, this time I was missing one point: is you know when we were talking about ransomware. Well, ransom have been in the 80s with Soros and the speculation on the pound, and there has been the Asian financial crisis, 97. So, are you, Brandon and Claudia, including you know? Um, not only hardware attacks, but, you know, I, I would call them soft attacks, which can collapse the whole economic system in some states or even globally. I'm not sure uh, that I fully get the question. Yeah, no, uh, sorry. But, you know, well, <clears throat> you were talking a little bit about hardware and the resilience. And I'm talking about a little bit of soft, you know, the soft tools to make ransoms regarding, you know, attacks on the financial market. So like hybrid attacks, like yeah. information? Ah, okay, yeah. okay, okay, now I, now I get it. Well, there's, there's usually a hard element in that as well, but anyway, um, maybe I, I start, Brandon, is that okay? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, so what we do see, I'm not sure that I fully got it, but let's try. Um, what we do see is, um, um, the element of, of disinformation, or actually information sometimes, or um, hack and leaks for, is, is a very good example, where basically what you do is you try to extract information, usually in a, in a, in a way that is criminal, for example, by, by hacking some, some famous people, some celebrities, some politicians, whatnot. And you basically take that information and then you leak some of it in order to support a narrative. And then you basically try to drive that narrative in form of a disinformation campaign. So that's one of the things we see, for example, before um, um, elections. Um, so those are the things we also see. And they have a political dimension because they're steered. Um, they're, there's a target behind this. Um, and we do see that as well. Um, we are also, of course, looking into the financial market. That's one of the examples you, you were saying. Um, we do see that as well. Um, and, and here our colleagues from a German institute called BaFin, they are the institution that is responsible for this. They take care of this. And, and I have some experience, of course, from the European Central Bank. This is indeed also a topic um, that is under scrutiny and where we have to, to pay attention to. It's not just ransomware attacks. It's also espionage. It's also sabotage. It's also disinformation. So it's a whole range of, of things we're looking at. 
And I think before I hand over to you, Mr. Wells, it's very important what you said, it's cooperation also between institutions, right? Because yes, Because BAFIN, for very example, important. sharing information, but Mr. Wells, maybe you can add, especially when it comes to info election security. Yeah, so, um, I, you know, I think that there is a natural relationship between the uh, security world and what we expect in terms of building longer term resilience uh, that we need against a variety of types of threats, including um, uh, influence operations as discussed or potentially other types of uh, shocks uh, to critical systems, whether those are supply chain shocks or destabilization of markets. Some of that is obviously outside the responsibility of organizations like mine and, and Claudia's, but we tend to have to work very closely with them. So, for example, we work very closely with the Treasury uh, Department in the U.S. that's working with the financial industry to try to build longer term resilience, um, uh, where cybersecurity is just one of, of many risks that they need to take seriously. Um, on the disinformation front, obviously, this is a significant challenge. It's an area where I think we will see AI risks most profoundly um, uh, come to life in the, in the short term. Um, and again, there, it's really a matter of what does resilience really mean? Um, how do we build both uh, societal resilience to uh, make ourselves less susceptible to these types of, of influence operations? And then how do we create mechanisms to counter them quickly by kind of pointing to trusted voices within the community? For us, that's because of the decentralized nature of the way elections are conducted in the United States. It really has to do with kind of how do we um, uh, amplify the voice of local election officials who often are the ones with the best available information and who, because they are often local uh, community leaders, um, are, are the ones who can be, who can be trusted um, as opposed to someone speaking from Washington, D.C., far, far from uh, uh, from that community. And so um, that's a lot of the work that uh, that we're doing on that front. Thank you. I saw another question here and there. And there, sorry, the, the um, gentleman in the third row was first. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, no, uh, no engineer would ever build a bridge like we build modern software and operating systems, and no customer would accept it. Um, but if uh, you deliver software that isn't safe, usually you don't have a problem. The customer has a problem, which is not your problem. So, uh, um, and the second part is we learned that security can't be uh, patched into software and can't be tested into software, but either you design security into software or it is insecure. So how could we fit this together? Um, uh, a couple of decades ago, we accepted that uh, the responsibility and the liability are not bound together for this kind of product. Uh, product. Uh, should we maybe think about steering in a different direction? Hmm. Excellent question. So Brad, I'll, you, I'll, you I'll want to take the one? Start. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll start. I mean, it, you know, because this issue is again raised in the, in the last year's national cyber strategy in the U.S., where we do need to look at um, changes to the liability system. You are correct. Um, today, all the burden for for vulnerabilities in and defects in software um, are borne by the end user. Some people who are least often least able to actually address the underlying uh, underlying issue. That needs to that needs to change. Uh, the prospects for liability reform in this area are kind of not um, probably uh, great politically in the short term, uh, but it is an issue that needs to be worked because we do need to find ways of really fundamentally changing. Um, uh, the market here uh, to get the type of security outcomes that we want. Thank you, Mr. Wells. Um, there is uh, the lady with the green jacket. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Thank so you. Much. <clears throat> Sylvia Kalmar is my name. I'm uh, MD of uh, Public Affairs Agency Erste Lesung, and I would like to profit from this opportunity. Thank you for the Espen Institute having you both on a panel, which doesn't happen that often. My question is focusing on security versus sovereignty. We see it in Germany pretty often if we are talking about the digitalization of the public sector, that it's always a question how to increase sovereignty uh, and held a decent level of security. So I think I can elaborate on that for a long, but you both know the materia better than I do, so I would be very, very interested in your thoughts on that. 
As well, would you start? Um, first of all, I would not see this as mutually exclusive or a balance. I have to keep between the two, um, not at all. And if we want to talk about keeping balances, then let's throw in another one, which is really important in my opinion, which is digitalization itself, which also has to work. Um, so um, it's a it's a it's a complicated field, no doubt about it. Um, the question for me is. How do we proceed from here? Where can we actually gain ground and gain traction um, when it comes to moving forward and involving our digital landscapes in such a way that indeed we pay um, proper attention to cybersecurity? We will not be able to do digitalization without cybersecurity, and we will also not be able to um, evolve over the long term if we don't have enough sovereignty in it. Uh, but sovereignty is not just only about um, um, products. It's also not to be confused with autarky. That's another thing. What we need to figure out in Europe is what part of the digital value chain do we want to place our focus on? And that is a very, very strategic decision. We need to be know what we are good at. What are we good at? And what can we contribute to the digital value chain? And there are things where I believe that our partners, so good to have you here, Brenton, um, might be way ahead of us. Do we really have to copy that, or can we just combine our forces and see what our respective partners are good at? The example I usually bring is uh, car manufacturing. Despite Tesla, I still believe we, buy, we build pretty good cars, you know? So on the other hand, we don't produce all the different spare parts ourselves. So for example, we don't produce wheels, car wheels. Um, 18 out of the 20 biggest uh, wheel manufacturers on this planet are not from Europe. And nonetheless, we would consider uh, um, the European automobile industry as a pretty strong one. So we, you can have sovereignty without being totally um, um, independent of everyone else. So for me, the important part is how can we combine our forces in the digital value chain and make sure that cybersecurity is at the right place in all parts of the value chain. Coming back to security by design and by default, it has to be built in. Thank you. You built the perfect bridge for me, actually. Oh. Thank you. And before Stormy kicks me from the stage, I would love to uh, ask the final question and please a one sentence answer. Uh, cooperation and um, is also learning from each other. So when you look at the United States, uh, Ms. Platon, what is the one thing that you consider a best practice and something which we as Germans should adapt? Oh, I love the guys you are, uh, are doing business. Uh, so I really do like the way you're taking risks, um, um, calculated risks, and just run with it. Thank you. Mr. Wells, what's the German thing you want to establish in America? I thought I needed that. Um, so uh, that is, uh, that's a, it's an interesting question. You know, I, I don't know that there's one thing that I want to uh, establish, but um, I think what we are trying to do is to further the partnership so that the, the cyber defense cooperation between the two countries is seamless. Um, I think we have an extremely close relationship with BSI. We do a lot of expert to expert exchanges, particularly in some of the more critical areas like uh, operational technology, control system, security issues. And I think what I'm hoping is that we continue to mature that uh, to the point where uh, our countries are equally protected and, and, and well secured and um, we'll leave some of the broader policy making to others. So partnership on eye level. Great. Thank you so much for your time and talking to us. It's been a pleasure.